It's Wednesday, and you're listening to Warlock Wednesday on anyotherpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to another Warlock Hour, Warlock Wednesdays with Razor, and I've got a nice show lined up for you today. i got some announcements to make, some you might have already heard if you've been paying attention to any news earlier in the week. However, we're going to kick things off, as always, with the comic book releases, and from DC this week, we've got a few number 19s, just going to read them out. Batman, Batgirl, and Suicide Squad, all issues number 19 for those three. Also from DC, Constantine number two, and Django Unchained number three of a six-part miniseries. From Marvel this week, we have the Age of Ultron um, comic continuing with issue number five of a ten-part series. Hawkeye number nine, Secret Avengers number three, Uncanny Avengers number six, and Wolverine number two. Your independent comics for this week from Dark Horse Comics, Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 9, Number 20, Star Wars Number 4 from Dynamite Entertainment, Vampirella Number 28, and Vampirella Strikes Number 4. IDW Publishing pu- puts out a few comics this week Doctor Who Prisoners of Time Number 3 of a 12 part miniseries, True Blood Number 11, Star Trek Countdown to Darkness Number 4 of the four-part miniseries. And finally, from Image Comics, Walking Dead number 109. So that's your comic book releases for this week. I myself will be picking up a few of these titles. I hope you will too. And there's many other titles to look out there. Those are just the ones that I picked out that seemed interesting this week. So moving on from comic book news right into the movie news, we're going to look at the box office numbers from this past weekend. And although I thought it was going to succeed very well and do extremely... uh, do, do fans proud, I did not expect this. Evil Dead captures the number one spot uh, this past weekend, bringing in $25.7 million. It was also the number one theater at my local theater. Uh, on the weekend, they even had to open up extra cinema to put it in for some of the shows because it was just selling out so uh, so fast. So this movie is a remake of the original The Evil Dead by Sam Raimi, and uh, very much a movie on its own. You do not have to see the original to get anything in this. Those of you who have will catch the little nods to the original, but however, it was very much its own movie and a very successful one as it took the number one spot this weekend. Uh, It bumped G.I. Joe Retaliation, which moved down to the number two spot with $20.8 million. The Crudes holding strong in the number three spot with twenty point six million, and another new movie, or new to three D that is, Jurassic Park three D comes in at fourth spot for eighteen point six million. So that's uh that's added to the totals of its original release, even though this is a three D release, though that money will be added to the original release. So already uh eighteen million dollars this weekend and it had a budget of ten million when it was originally made, so that's already added to the totals that it made when it first came out, which was huge. Uh, coming in at number five spot, Olympus Has Fallen with $10.1 million. and uh, Tyler Perry's Temptation Confessions of a Marriage Counselor comes in at number six, and that is a mouthful to say. $10 million for that movie. Coming in in the number seven spot, Oz the Great and Powerful, another $8 million for that one, bringing its uh, five-week total to $212 million, and it's almost made its budget back, which was $215. Uh, the Host drops from 6th to 8th, and it captures the 8th spot with $5.1 million. The Call, $3.5 million in number 9, and rounding out the top 10, Admission, $1.9 million. So those are your top 10 movies for this week. And what's coming out next week, you might ask? Well, there's two movies that uh, you might want to consider. Uh, the Jackie Robinson, true sto- or based on his uh, story, uh, number f- or just 42, that's the name of the movie, which was the number he wore when he played for the Dodgers. It's all about him breaking the color, bar- color barrier in the Major League Baseball. The other movie coming out this week, uh, franchise movie, 
Scary Movie 5. Yes, that's right. They're back to making fun of scary movies now that there's been so many of them. Not all of them good, but there's been so many of them, so there's a lot of stuff to poke fun at. And heck, if you want to laugh at Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen, maybe this is the time to do it. So, Scary Movie 5 and 42 are your new releases for this coming weekend. So, into the movie news, sticking with the Jurassic Park theme, because, as I said, it was uh, very successful this weekend in its 3D re-release. Uh, they talk about Jurassic Park 4, which is going into production very shortly, and uh, one of the paleontologist consultants, who's actually consulted on all three previous Jurassic Park incarnations, has said that there will be a new dinosaur shown in this one, so one we have not seen before. The question is, which one will it be? We've seen pterodactyls, we've seen um, Tyrannosaurus Rex, we've seen Velociraptors, uh, I can't think of, uh, we've seen Stegosaurus, not sure off the top of my head which we've seen so far. Uh, that spitter dinosaur, I don't remember what that one was called, but there was that one. So, I mean, there's been quite a few, so what's left that uh, we've also seen brontosauruses. Uh, that just came to my mind as well. So I'm not sure what's left out there that they can show, but apparently there's going to be a new one for Jurassic Park 4, which is set to hit theaters June 13th in 2014, which will also be in 3D. From here, let's move on to space uh, and Guardians of the Galaxy. Kevin Feig, our superhuman, or at least our superhero producer, uh, producer of many of the Marvel films, uh, talking about Phase 2 and 3 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And he was on a discussion panel, and he had this to say. Uh, he was talking to about... Uh, sorry, he's talking about Guardians of the Galaxy being a movie in space. He revealed, We immediately liked the idea of making a movie based on a comic mostly unknown by people and that present various superheroes in one movie. I think they spelt that wrong. They did. I, re I read it wrong because it was spelt wrong. It's present various superheroes in one movie. Although it's set up from another part of the universe, a human will be in a superhero role of Peter Quill, played by Chris Pratt. There will be lots of characters from a sexy warrior to an animated tree and a raccoon with a gun. Who doesn't want to see a raccoon with a gun? I know I do. It's a unique franchise, and we are pleased that it's so different from what we've done so far. Um... When he was asked about Phase 2, how the uh, importance of the Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy is not is important to the phase, uh, he went on to say, Currently, the third phase is developing. Uh, the 99% of our time right now is being used for Phase 2. The development of the Avengers 2 and the Guardians of the Galaxy keeps us very busy. Definitely, we're not leaving aside the old glories, and we can also see familiar faces such as Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America. So their focus is on Phase 2, but they are thinking about Phase 3. Uh, then he goes on to say that possibly in talks to play Gamora, who is the sexy warrior that he spoke of earlier, um, is none other than Uhura from the new Star Trek series. Zoe Zaldana is in talks to play uh, Gamora in Guardians of the Galaxy, which... Uh, I haven't read any Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't know much about it other than there's a raccoon with a gun. And like I said, who doesn't want to see that? Uh, I've already been disappointed with the casting of former WWE superstar Dave Bautista in the Drax the Destroyer role, as you may have heard on past episodes of the Warlock Hour. However, I think Zoe Zaldana will be a great casting for Gamora. Uh, she's, um, she was very good in a movie that she did that probably not many people seen called, um, oh, I can't even think of the name of it right now. Oh, it's going to bug me. I'm going to have to look that up. So while I look that up, she was uh, basically a vigilante in that movie, and she kicked some serious ass. Plus, she was in the movie The Losers, which was a, another role where she was a serious butt kicker. So, I mean, she definitely has the chops to play a role of a kick-ass space hero, I guess you could call it. And the movie that I was thinking of before was Columbiana. And that was such a great, fantastic film. And if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. She's amazing in it. And uh, definitely, if you see that movie, you'll definitely understand why I think she would fit this role so well. Uh, other rumors for the voice of Rocket Raccoon, Jason Statham. Another person that I 
thoroughly enjoy. Uh, and if he voices Rocket Raccoon, the raccoon with the gun, all the more power to it. Now, one of the things on this panel Kevin was asked was what he would like to see for Phase 3. And his first words... Doctor Strange. He says, I love the aura of mystery that surrounds this superhero and the magical world that surrounds him. We've never faced anything like this, and there is a lot of material that we could exploit. I would love to also see a new superhero in the ranks of the Avengers. We shall see. Now, in the past, uh, Doctor Strange has been one of the rumored movies for Phase 3, and when the super producer has said that he wants to see it, I'm sure there's probably a good indication that we could definitely see uh, Doctor Strange in Phase 3. But that's still a ways away. Continuing on with the Marvel Guardians of the Galaxy universe, an ad in England was recently put out that suggests the movie may be set in the future. So this uh, kind of thinking may be... Um, the Guardians of the Galaxy to be in Avengers 2 would have to travel back in time, so that would add a, another whole other aspect of the movie. But uh, the ad that was placed was said, uh, futuristic-looking electric bikes needed for major feature film. The MCI, which is, I believe, the Motorcycle Industry Association. Nope, that can't be it. That was something else. Yeah, the MCI A. I missed the letter, that's why has been contacted by the filmmakers of Marvel, who are looking for electric bikes with a futuristic look to use in a major feature film that will be shot in England in an imaginary 2045. This would definitely be the future. The filmmakers have not been able to specify the exact number needed, only that it would be definitely be more than one to be decided by the director. Manufacturers have who have something suitable and would welcome the chance to be involved can talk, contact, uh, and then they give the contact information. Uh, there. So, Guardians of the Galaxy could be set in the future. Uh, 2045 seems about right. We do know that Guardians of the Galaxy is shooting in England this summer, so it's a good possibility that this could be a futuristic movie, or they just want the stuff to look futuristic, and it's not actually going to be in 2045. They're just going to be space bikes. Who knows? But if they are set in 2045, they would have to come back in time to 2015, unless the Avengers spot is actually taking place uh, chronologically, and the Guardians of the Galaxy are going to meet them, and the movie Guardians of the Galaxy is actually after they meet the Avengers. But that would just be weird since the movie comes out first. But we'll just have to wait and see. Moving on, Prometheus co-writer... Uh, which a lot of people said that the Prometheus writing was not that great, that the that was actually one of the weak points was the story. However, the one of the co-writers is been tapped by Disney to write a script for a remake called The Black Hole. It was a Disney film back in 1979. I seen it when I was a little kid. I remember very little of it, other than they were on some space station-looking spaceship, but it was not a spaceship, it was a space station. And there was a black hole. <laughs> That's pretty much all I remember from it. But uh, the the reboot is planned, and uh, Disney has uh, got uh, one of the co-writers, uh, and I believe his name is John, and I don't even want to pronounce his last name. S P A I H T S. I would say Spitz or Spats. Just sounds wrong, but whatever. <laughs> he is being tapped to co-write it, and. Um, there's no director yet. Uh, we have not much known other than the fact that Disney wants to reboot it. So we'll have to wait and see more on that. I just found it interesting only because I do remember vaguely watching The Black Hole when I was a child. Moving on, Universal Pictures wants to reimagine one of the three R's of Hollywood these days, uh, Dracula. They're starting right from the beginning as if nothing's been made. Uh, they've cast their Dracula. Their Dracula will be played by Luke Evans. And uh, this is s said to explore the origins of the character, where it's going to be the true history of Prince Vlad the Impaler. It seeks to depict Dracula as a flawed hero in a tragic love story set in a dark age of magic and war. So we'll just have to wait and see what goes with that. But they do have um, Gary Shore directing. It's going to be his directorial debut. It was written by Matt Sazama and Burke Sharpless, 
and uh, Michael DeLuca will be producing. So uh, if you know any of those names, you know that it could be an interesting movie or it could be a big flop. But Luke Evans is set to be Dracula in this new rendition of The Great Vampire. Okay, uh, moving on. A lot of novels, especially young adult novels, are being made into movies. And The Maze Runner is the new one that's being made into a movie. I have not read this book myself. I actually had never heard of it until now. However, with the success of The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins being made into movies, a lot of studios pick up these types of books and option their rights to make movies when things succeed. We saw that when Harry Potter succeeded. We saw a whole influx of young adult novels being optioned by studios. Some succeeded, some didn't. Aragon obviously failed. Twilight, as much as I hate it, succeeded. Um... So it's a hit-or-miss thing, and now Maze Runner is being picked up. It's being directed by Wes Ball, and they've cast their female lead, Kaya Scodelario. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, (laughs) but she will be cast as the female lead. And um, it's a trilogy, which seems to be the norm for these kind of books. Uh, and what it says is, is dystopian in nature follows the story of Thomas, a young man who wakes up with no memory in a large enclosed area called the Glade. Like Thomas, none of the other kids in the Glade know who they are or why they're there. All they know is that every morning the doors to a sprawling maze open up, every night they close, and every 30 days a new boy arrives. When a girl, Teresa, the first girl to en- ever enter the Glade, arrives, she delivers a surprising message. And that's all the only synopsis I have for this. I'm assuming that the girl, Teresa, will be played by this actress that was cast for the female lead. Sticking with those young adult novels, Mockingjay will start shooting this fall in September. Uh, the first... Well, I shouldn't say the first part. However, the movie is being released in two parts, Hunger Games uh, Mockingjay Part 1 and Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. They will be filmed at the same time, released separately. Uh, They start filming September 6th or 16th. Where did I see the date? 16th. So that means with all the post-production being worked on for Catching Fire, which comes out this November... uh, They'll already be in principal photography. Actually, they'll be in full-fledged mode by November uh, if they're starting filming in September. For those of you who haven't read the books, the next little bit is going to be spoilers. So if you want to skip the next little bit, you might want to. Uh, Basically, the Mockingjay uh, storyline takes place as a political thriller type thing where there's a lot of politics involved. So the the writer, the screenwriter for this one is Danny Strong, who's definitely used to this because he's uh, done Game Change for HBO and Recount, so he's used to this kind of um, story. It's a politically driven drama that does have strong character moments, but he's used to this, so that's why he's been tapped to uh, write the screenplay. Um, the director for Catching Fire, Francis Lawrence, will continue to be the director for the next two movies, or technically one, because they're going to film it as one movie. So it won't be a change like they had between uh, Hunger Games and Catching Fire, where there was a director directorial change. So there's no word yet of where they're going to split the movie. However, uh, going by past movies that were split, and my personal experience, I think they'll probably split the movie before the revolution hits the capital. Basically, uh, the the whole second movie will be the invading of the actual capital where the, the teams are sent out into the capital to basically take it over. And I think that would probably be a good split where they're leaving to go to the capital. Because there is so much to cover in Mockingjay. And in such a short book, really, they cover so much before and then at the capital itself when they take it over and there's so much afterwards. So I, I could definitely see this being a probably an hour and 45 minutes for each movie. They are scheduled to release in theaters uh, November 21st, 2014 for part one and November 20th, 2015 for part two. So there will be a full year gap 
between part one and part two, which kind of sucks because a lot of splits tend to shorten the gap uh, just so that we can get them out quicker. However, I think it was due to the fact that 2015 is such a huge summer release for a lot of movies that they just did not want to compete with things like Star Wars Episode Seven, Avengers 2, uh, Justice League, possibly. Uh, and, and I think that makes perfect sense. It sucks as a moviegoer because you have to wait so long in between. So moving from movie news to TV news. It's official. Announced on April 3rd, which was last Wednesday. So if you listened to the show last Wednesday, you might already know this. But I didn't announce it then because obviously I record on Monday. It's official. Jimmy Fallon will replace Jay Leno on The Tonight Show. In spring of 2014, uh, Jimmy Fallon will be the new Tonight Show host. Uh, Jay Leno is retiring again. Uh, we'll see how permanent it is. Uh, I, I don't really watch too much late night television anymore. I think the only guy I watch is Jimmy Kimmel. And to be perfectly honest, unless I like the guests that he has lined up, I usually watch the opening monologue sections and you know the little snippets that he does with the going out of the street, and that's pretty much it. So... I, I I really don't care, but I know there's a lot of people out there that still watch The Tonight Show. Well, Jimmy Fallon will be your new host as of the spring. All right. The Marvel Universe S.H.I.E.L.D. show has cast another agent. Former, former Angel star J. August Richards will join the cast in a secret role. They're not revealing who he's playing. They're not saying if it's an agent, if he's a bad guy or what he's going to be playing in this series, but he will be joining the cast. And more on the S.H.I.E.L.D. show, it is no co longer called S.H.I.E.L.D. They have changed the name officially to Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That will be the title that will go on the air in this fall. And, um, yeah, so there's not much more to announce other than that, so we have a new cast member and a new title for the Marvel foray into live action television which i'm definitely looking forward to especially with agent colson played by clark Gregg, returning okay uh walking dead fans gail ann hurd who's one of the lead writers on the walking dead was uh oh i better m mention this if you haven't seen the fina finale you're idiots um, I mean, it's been two weeks now, so you, you should have seen it by now. But there are spoilers for those of you who haven't seen it, so you may want to skip this section now, because I'm going to spoil stuff right now. Right now? The governor is still alive. He's out there with Shumpert and Martinez. So we know that because that's basically how we left that section of the show. And Gail Ann Hurd has said that they're still out there. They still got significant firepower if they go to Woodbury at this point. Woodbury's not as protected as it used to be. I think everyone was traumatized by what happened, and I think they feel safer in the prison. She goes on to say, I, uh, because a lot of fans, including myself, felt the zombies or the walkers were way underutilized in season three. Uh, more of the action was definitely human on human as opposed to human on zombie. There was definitely not a lot of zombie threats. Uh, you never really worried about zombies that much in season three. In fact, I think the only uh, instances where there was severe zombie worry was the zombie bomb dropped by the governor, which again, it wasn't that big because everything's been so much the governor versus Rick's crew. And uh, the when Merle goes to attack the uh, the governor himself, and he lures in the zombies, and that's pretty much it. Other than that, there wasn't a lot of whole zombie on human violence. We need more of that. It's a zombie show. It's called The Walking Dead for crying out loud. So she goes on to say, I don't think in a show that goes from season to season we are living in a zombie apocalypse. We're living in an apocalypse where we know that unless someone has brain trauma, they're going to come back. Regardless of how they die, they're going to turn into a zombie. So I think it would be a good bet to say that zombies become more threatening in seasons to come. Now, I don't know what she's hinting at. She obviously can't spoil too much for us. However, maybe we're going to see more zombies uh, being more educated in a sense. They're going to band together? I don't know. But hopefully we see more zombie-on-human violence in season four. 
And finally, in television news, sadly, Christopher Eccleston will not be part of the 50th anniversary. In fact, he was the one guy that I probably had a good indication that he wasn't going to be. When he stepped down as the Ninth Doctor, he basically said that he was done. He enjoyed his time on the show for his, uh, I believe, 13 episodes. However, he really felt that he's played the role and he doesn't want to come back to it. Some call that smug and ignorant. Others call it, well, he he has done what he needed to do. He got Doctor Who back to the fans because there was a 20-year a gap in between when the original series ended and the new series began. And the Doctor Who's fans have definitely grown from 2005 when Eccleston, well, 2004, 2005, when Eccleston first started as the ninth Doctor and then moved into David Tennant, who I still believe is the best Doctor. Uh, so, I mean, I don't blame the man. However, I would have liked to see them there. With the 50th anniversary, you want to bring back as many people as possible. We've already lost Captain Jack. Now we're losing the ninth Doctor. Uh, we have... Uh, former doctors who are who actors who have passed away who've played the doctor, although they've said if they were to use them they'd use like stock footage. Uh, I don't know for something that's supposed to be huge. It's it's looking less and less huge. Like I am happy that David Tennant and Billy Piper are coming back. However, if that's all you get, how is that huge in my opinion? So again, I, I can reiterate what I said when John Barrowman. Uh, announced that he was not going to be part of it, that actors are usually told to deny everything. However, it's BBC itself saying this, and, I mean, they could just be pulling our legs too, but it looks more and more like there's uh, less and less elation for this 50th anniversary than the fans would expect. Uh, I mean, you expect the, all the stops to be pulled out, and it doesn't look like they're trying very hard, in my opinion. I mean... We have seen producers quit already, so who knows what's going on there. So that's it for entertainment news this week. So we're going to go right into sports. Um, I'm going to go with the NHL first, then some baseball. So for the NHL, we have two teams that have officially clinched a playoff spot. What that means, people, is they cannot miss the playoffs. They are definitely going to be there. And that's Pittsburgh and Chicago. They're officially in the playoffs. No team can eliminate them until the playoffs. So, looking at our Eastern Conference standings, sitting in first place, the aforementioned Pittsburgh Penguins with 58 points. Second place right now is the Montreal Canadiens with 55 points. In third place sits the Washington Capitals, and the only reason they're there is because they're leading div the division right now with 42 points being chased by both Winnipeg and not so much Carolina now, since their goaltender got injured, they've kind of dropped way off the scene. So Winnipeg's probably their only challenge to take that spot from them. Uh, sitting in fourth place, Boston with 54 points. They're challenging Montreal for that top scene in the Northeast, which would mean Boston would move into second place, and Montreal would drop to fourth. Toronto's holding on to the fifth spot with a huge win tonight over the New York Rangers, tonight being Monday. Uh, they moved into that spot with a nice 8-point lead over the ninth place team, the New Jersey Devils, with 48 points. Ottawa in 6th place at 44 points. The Rangers having uh, lost on Monday night, 42 points in 7th, also with 42 points. The New York Islanders sitting in 8th. On the outside looking in right now, New Jersey with 40, Winnipeg with 40, Buffalo with 38 and Philadelphia with 37. Buffalo and Philadelphia are trying as best they can to squeak in, but with 10 games or less remaining for these teams, it's getting harder and harder by the day. Uh, New Jersey, Winnipeg, 40 points each. They're two points out of the last place. Also, Winnipeg fighting for that spot with Washington, although Washington's really pouring it on right now. They're going to have to fight really hard. They've only got eight games left because they've already played 40. So they're one, they're one of the teams that are really close to the end uh, right now. So they, they've got to get all the points they can get if they want to make the playoffs. Personally, I think we might see status quo from here on out. I don't think there will be much movement other than maybe Boston switching with Montreal for the second and fourth spot. Uh, personally, I would love to see that because what that would set up as the standings are right now would be a Montreal-Toronto first-round matchup. And I know my Habs fans out there 
and my Habs fans' friends would love that because then we have some betting going on. Moving on to the Western Conference, as I said, Chicago clinched a playoff spot. They are now at 62 points, leading the whole of the NHL with only 10 games remaining. They could capture the President's Trophy sooner rather than later. Still only five losses in the uh, uh, regulation loss column. I said they'd finish with less than 10. They have 10 games remaining. As long as they win six, I'm golden there. Number two in the Western Conference, the Anaheim Ducks with 57 points. Vancouver holding on to that third spot right now with 48 points. Los Angeles Kings have moved into fourth spot with 48 points. San Jose are fifth with 47 points. Minnesota sixth with 46 points. St. Louis Blues seventh with 44 points. And rounding out the top eight, 43 points for Detroit. They have a three-point lead with over Phoenix, and there's some surging teams here. With the Columbus Blue Jackets, the Edmonton Oilers, Dallas Stars, and the Phoenix Coyotes all trying to push in for that last playoff spot. But again, time is running out. Ten games or less left for most of these teams. So it's going to be a dogfight in the West and not so much dogfight in the East. There's only a few teams that even have an outside chance of making it in. New Jersey and Winnipeg having the best chances of trying to squeak in. So going to be a final couple of weeks fun couple of weeks for those teams all right looking at statistics unfortunately even though he's out with a broken jaw still leading the points Sidney crybaby crosby with 56 he's also leading in assists with 41 our goal leader is now tied steven samkos and ovechkin both with 25 goals as i said washington's been pouring it on of late and ovechkin specifically and he's now tied for the goal lead, goal lead in that area. Plus minus goes to Sidney Crosby and Chris Kunitz and Sheldon Surrey, all with a plus 26. Uh, your goals against average is still Mr. Craig Anderson of the Ottawa Senators with a 1.53. Save percentage 950 for Mr. Anderson. And in wins, it's Nicholas Bagstrom of the Minnesota Wild with 20. Shutouts still being held by Pecorini, although he's now joined by Mike Smith of the Phoenix Coyotes, who came off of injury this week to record a shutout to tie him. So they both have five shutouts, and that's your statistics. Now, speaking of statistics, although I just listed those goalies, the front runners for the Vezina Trophy are the surging teams rather than the teams that have been kind of winning games throughout. Sergei Br Bobrovsky of the Columbus Blue Jackets, of late, his record has been impeccable. He started off very slow, so his record of 13, 10, and 6 does not seem impressive, but he has a goals against average of 2.12, a save percentage of 927, and in the last little while, he's been probably one of the best goalies to have if you're on a fantasy team and you need a goalie he's definitely one of the best ones to have as i said he's been surging another one who's been surging henrik lundqvist started off the season very rough had a low save percentage he's now tops in most of these categories in save percentage goals against average and uh he's definitely winning games now so it's definitely a good shot for him to do well Another one of the Boston Bruins, Tuka Rask. Now, he's been doing it pretty much all year. Boston's been a force to be reckoned with. And in the last eight games, Rask is 6-1-1 one one with 1.97 goals against average and a 941 save percentage. These three goalies are probably in your top picks for Vezina Trophy finalists. Another one you have to consider is uh, Carey Price, as much as I hate to say it, of the Montreal Canadiens. He's been pretty stellar. He's had 19 wins, 7 losses, 4 in overtime, 2.26 goals against, 916 save percentage. And a few weeks ago, I couldn't remember when we were talking with Zach how many games a goalie would have to play in the shortened season to be considered for an award. That number is 25. So Craig Anderson, I don't think, would qualify for that right now. However, if he can finish out the season... He's played 16 games at the at right now. Uh, they have, let's see, Ottawa has 10 games left, which means he has to play nine of those 10 games to qualify for any of the trophies. It's possible, but unsure of what's going to happen there. So 
that's that's the number of games they need to play. They need to have 25 starts to be considered for an award. Looking at your three stars from this past week, first star Alex Ovechkin. As I said, he had he's been on a tear with the Washington Capitals. The Washington Capitals have been on a stretch run. Uh, they've pulled into that spot, that playoff spot to take the, the uh, third place overall. They've taken it over from Winnipeg. Uh, as I said, Carolina has been slipping, so that division has always been weak. Well, Washington and Ovechkin have been surging. He had seven goals and two assists in four games last last week. That is huge numbers for a player who looked like he's fallen off the planet. Um, he's definitely pouring it on, and he's doing it at the right time going into the playoffs. Now, I say every week that there's always at least one goalie in the three stars, and that's true. However, this week we have two. Second star, Brian Elliott of the St. Louis Blues. Brian Elliott had a horrible start to the season. And when I say horrible, he was even sent down to the minors because the Blues were not winning with him. He was he was letting in goals left, right, and center. It didn't matter. And uh, Halak came back from an injury, and Halak really stood up, and then he got injured again. Well, this left the door open for Elliott to s say, hey, let let me give it a shot. Well, in this past week, he posted a record of 3-0 with a 1.45 goals against average and a 9.52 save percentage, and with one of those being a shutout. So he's done very well of late, and it's helped the St. Louis Blues to move into the uh, uh, more solidified, not 100% sure, but more solidified playoff spot. And if you get into the playoffs... Anything can happen. So he's your second star, and I said there was going to be two goalies this week. Your third star, Henrik Lundqvist of the New York Rangers. He had four games this week. He was 3-0-1 with uh, the one being a shootout loss. He had 1.22 goals against average and a 9.62 save percentage. He won 4-2 over the Jets, 6-1 over the Penguins, 2-1 um, shootout loss to the... Uh, to the Penguins because they had a back-to-back, -back, and then he won 4-1 against Carolina. So he's had a big week himself. That's why two goalies are named the Stars. And Ovechkin leading the way with seven goals in four games. That is huge. All right, final NHL news. It's official. Uh, announced on Sunday, I think it was, maybe... Yes, announced Sunday night, or Sunday afternoon, the Detroit Red Wings will be hosting the 2014 NHL Winter Classic. Uh, for those of you who are fans of the NHL, you know that the 2013 Winter Classic, which was canceled due to, this, due to the lockout, uh, was supposed to be played in Detroit. It was going to feature the Detroit Red Wings versus the Montreal, or for, sorry, versus the Toronto Maple Leafs at um, the, I believe the site was the... Michigan Wolverines, um, the big house. Uh, I forget what the name of the the field is. I think it's uh, how you, oh, it's just called the University of Michigan Field, the big house. For any Michigan Michigan Wolverine fans out there, you know it is the big house. That's what I know it as because I'm a Wolverines fan, at least in football. I don't really follow any of their other sports. Although I did pick them to win the March Madness, and they're in the finals. So who knows? Maybe they won tonight. I should check that out. Well. I'm letting you know that it's official. The NHL has definitely uh, set the Winter Classic for 2014 to be back in Detroit, and it will feature the Detroit uh, Red Wings and the Toronto Maple Leafs. So the, they do not lose the Winter Classic fully. Unfortunately, it's a year later, but what can you do, right? Uh, they are going to get it back, which is definitely something that... Uh, the city of Detroit would love to see, and it's definitely something that um, I would love to see since it features my Toronto Maple Leafs. And just looking at the NCAA, unfortunately, Michigan did not win the national title. Louisville did. Um, they were a number one ranked team versus the number four ranked Michigan Wolverines. The final score was 82-76, which is pretty darn close to what I said the final score was going to be, although I had it 80-77 to for Michigan. However... I don't follow college basketball. However, a friend of mine and a friend of this network here, Mr. James, said, you got to do it, you got to do it, you got to do it. Well, I did it, and I beat him. I got 79 points, and unfortunately for him, he only got 59. So I won. What do you know? 
I had no idea what I was doing. I just picked my favorite team all the way through, and it just turned out that they made it to the finals. Uh, I know in uh, watching def- uh, sports shows all the time that um, many things were collapsed by number one seeds going out very fast. So that's a brief bit of NCAA basketball news because normally I don't cover basketball because, well, I don't follow it that much. All right, going to take a little break here. I'm going to play our little Rob Chiquetto spots so you can listen in, and uh, I'll be right back with some baseball news. Hi, I'm Rob Cicchetto, and you're listening to AnotherPodcast.com. Hi, I'm Rob Cicchetto, creator of Zombie Portraits. You can check out Zombie Portraits at ZombiePortraits.com. So thanks, Rob, and as you heard, you can visit his website and check out some of those uh, those uh, links that he's talking about, or those zombie things that he's talking about, because uh, definitely, if you're a zombie fan, you want to check it out. Rob Shikato, thank you very much, and moving on, we're going to get into some baseball news. Uh, I said last week that I was going to do basically the same thing I do for hockey, and now that we've actually had some baseball played, other than the one game that we had last week when I recorded... We're going to take a look at some standings. So in the American League, I'm just going to give you your division leaders and the guys who are kind of right there. So your division leader in the East, Boston Red Sox, five wins, two losses. Right behind them are the Baltimore, excuse me, the Baltimore Orioles with three wins, four losses. In the Central Division, you have Chicago White Sox, four wins, two losses, followed by the Kansas City Royals with four wins and three losses. In the West, Oakland leading the way, tied with Texas both with five wins and two losses. Moving to the National League, or the Senior Circuit as it's sometimes re- known, in the NL East, the Atlanta Braves, 6-1, and one, running away with it, not really. Sitting right behind them, the New York Mets, 5-2. and two. And besides, it's really early in the season, guys. you got to remember, there's 162 games to be played, and we've only got about seven or eight games played for most teams. In the Central, we have five wins, two losses, the Cincinnati Reds leading the way, and right behind them, sort of, the St. Louis Cardinals at 3-4. and four. Arizona leading the West with 5-1, and one, tied with the Colorado Rockies, 5-1. and one. Now, as a Jays fan, I'm very disappointed right now because they've played six games and only have won two of them, and these were all home games against teams, well, they played the Cleveland Indians. Last year when they played the Cleveland Indians in the first uh, series, they played three games, the Jays won two. It was nice. They had a 2-1 lead. In their second series, again, they won two out of three. They were 4-2 and two last year at this time with a worse team on paper than they have now. Problem is, R.A. Dickey, who's a big knuckleball pitcher, seems to have trouble pitching in the Sky Dome. And yes, I called it the Sky Dome because to me, it will always be the Sky Dome. I don't care that Mr. Rogers went and spent millions of dollars to put his name outside that building. It is the Sky Dome, and that's what I'm going to call it. He's not pitching well there, and not only is he not pitching well, none of the pitchers seem to be pitching very well. The best pitcher the Jays have had in their first five-man rotation was J.A. Happ, who took the fifth starting role out of Ricky Romero's hands, and he did a really good job. Now, unfortunately, he did throw a lot of pitches, and he didn't last very long. He only lasted five and a third innings in his outing. However, he shut down the Boston Red Sox. Something that teams were having trouble doing all through spring and into the regular season. I mean, the Red Sox have only lost twice, that being one of them. So, uh, he's been their best pitcher, and their other best pitcher has been their closer, who we've only seen once. Because he was only needed once, because they've been losing. In fact, their last game, they lost 13 nothing, giving up six home runs in the process. So... It's a it's a long season. They've played six games. There's 156 left to go. So, you know, it's a long way to go. But it's not a nice start, and you just hope that uh, maybe they can pull a New York Yankees. Start off slow and finish strong. Get into the playoffs. Anything can happen, and it's a long way to the playoffs. So looking at some, some statistics, uh, in the hitting categories, uh, we have three hitters who are batting 500 at the moment, and that's Andrew Jones of the, or let me just, unfortunately it just lists their initial, and there's so many Joneses in baseball, sorry, it's Adam Jones of the Baltimore Orioles. I'm just going to 
maybe click on these names a little bit just to see their full name. Jed Lowry of the Oakland Athletics and Carlos Santana. They're leading the way, all batting 500. Oh, sorry, Carlos Santana of the Cleveland Indians. They're all leading the way uh, for the hitting as it goes right now. Your home run leaders are Justin Upton of the Atlanta Braves with six home runs. And uh, i got to open this again to see you. Michael Moores of the Seattle Mariners with five home runs. Those are your top home run hitters. And your top RBI guys right now are, uh, I'm going to say Carlos Davis. I might be wrong. Chris Davis. That was wrong. Of the Baltimore Orioles with 17 runs driven in so far. So maybe the Baltimore Orioles are kind of real. Also, John Buck of the New York Mets has 12 RBIs, and he's second in that category. So those are your home run RBIs and average leaders. So let's move on to some pitching. And maybe I'll know these names a little bit better and looking at it right now. No, no, I don't. <laughs> so your win leaders right now are Clay Buckholtz of the Boston Red Sox, you Darvish of the Texas Rangers, uh, Clayton Kershaw of the Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, Justin Masterson of the Cleveland Indians. All these guys have two wins. Uh, for me, the best pitcher right now of these are Clayton Kershaw, who has a 0, 0.0 ERA, which means no runs allowed. And also, I'm going to say Paul, yep, I'm right, Paul Ma Mahom of the Atlanta Braves, who also has a 0, 0.0 ERA. But you also have to look at Clay Buckholtz and um, uh, who's the other guy here? We've got Matt Harvey, both with a 0.64 ERA. So those guys are definitely pitching well to start the season. They're 2-0, and as I said. Um they're definitely uh, helping their teams to lead the way. Okay, also I want to look at, so that's your statistics. I want to look at uh, top rookies. In batting, uh, so your rookies are basically doing, uh, on average, pretty well. You've got Miami, who has H Hechevaria. I don't, again... Adini, this guy has a weird name. Adini Hachavaria. I believe he's one of the guys that they got from the Blue Jays in the big trade. And he's a uh, top rookie for shortstops. He's batting uh, 300 right now with no, uh, no RBIs, but he has um, six hits in 20 at-bats. Uh, Rob Brantley, also of the Miami Mar I guess Are they still the Miami Marlins? I don't know. I know they were the Florida Marlins before they moved to Miami. Yes, they are still the Miami Marlins. I, you know, you move teams, you never know what they're going to be. So, uh, so Rob Brantley of the Miami Marlins, he's their catcher. He's uh, he's got an RBI at least. He's batting 300 as well. For average wise, though, your leader in that is from the St. Louis Cardinals, Matt Adams. He's batting 600 right now. And he has two RBIs. Only one rookie has a home run. He's also from the St. Louis Cardinals. And that would be Pete Cosma. So those are your top rookies in, in batting. Your top rookies in pitching. Um, not too many uh, starters. You've got two who have both won their games. So I'll just give you their names very quickly. From Oakland, you have Dan Straley. And from St. Louis, you have Shelby Miller. Both of them won their, their starts. Uh, their first starts, um, Shelby went five and a third innings, has a 3.38 ERA, but as I said, he won the game, so that's all that matters. Uh, Dan Straley went six and two thirds innings, and uh, he has a 2.7 ERA, so Oakland and St. Louis have some young starters that uh, are looking good right now, and we also have a young closer from Milwaukee. Now, he's a relief pitcher. I don't know if he's going to be their full-time closer. They, they don't, they're not sure if they're probably going to be splitting things. His name is Jim Henderson, and he has one save in one save opportunity. So that's good for him. No ERA, which means no runs allowed. He's only allowed three hits over four innings pitched and gotten six strikeouts. 
Uh, those four innings pitched are four actual games. So, as I said, he's not their official closer, but he has a save. So he's a relief pitcher who's pitching very well for the Milwaukee Brewers. And those are your top rookies. So you might want to add a couple of those guys to your fantasy teams. As I close up for the night, I have one more segment to do, and that's my WrestleMania recap. And uh, I did fairly well. I started off the night not so good, but I finished the night strong. So let's go over the list again. I'm just I'm looking at from what I said last week to what the actual winners were. So last week I said Y2J was going to lose to Fandango because I said Y2J was such a classy wrestler that he was going to let Fandango um, or lose so that Fandango kind of gets the push so that um, you know he gets to be a winner at WrestleMania. Jericho's done it in the past, and I was right. Fandango won the match over Chris Jericho. Albeit, it was kind of lucky, but hey, it's all scripted, right? We all know this. Those of you who don't, well, sorry, it is. <laughs> Unfortunately, Chris Jericho continues his losing streak at pay-per-views, but as I said, he's a classy wrestler, and this is the kind of thing that Chris Jericho will do. He'll lose to put over the young guy, because you know what? He's been there himself. The Tag Team Championships were fought, and yes... They were retained by Team Hell No, which is what I said would happen because I thought Dolph Ziggler was going to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase, which he did not. However, in that match, I did pick Del Rio to retain the title because I said Jack Swagger was no way he was going to win because, simply put, he has a DUI that still hasn't been settled. They don't know what's going to happen. He could end up in jail. He could end up doing community service. They're not sure what's going to happen. The court date hasn't happened yet. So I knew Jack Swagger wasn't going to win. Del Rio retained the title. Uh, Ziggler did not cash in and become world champion. But I'm still considering that a win because I picked Del Rio to win the match. Uh, one of the matches I got wrong. Ryback versus Mike Henry. I picked Ryback in a very boring match, which it was. Unfortunately, Mark Henry won, but it was still boring. Uh, the IC title, which took place before WrestleMania on the pre-show, didn't get to see it, so I did not get to see that I was wrong. I picked Wade Barrett to retain the title. However, The Miz, a guy who is awesome, actually won the title. So I'm not upset. I didn't care who won between these two. I just thought they were going to keep Wade Barrett with the title. However, this may open Wade Barrett up for some higher pushes. Maybe world title? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, and the final one that I got wrong was Randy Orton, Big Show, and Sheamus versus The Shield. I picked Sheamus as the winner. However, The Shield, once again, victorious as Big Show clocked Sheamus and Randy Orton at the end of the match to knock them out. Unfortunately, The Shield continues to roll, and I hate it. Alright, so back to the stuff where I actually picked the winners, the three biggest matches of the night... Undertaker versus CM Punk. Anybody who picked CM Punk, well, you don't know the WWE because there is no way the WWE would ever let Undertaker lose at WrestleMania. And they didn't. Undertaker won, and a score another one for me. The second co-main event, if you will, Triple H versus Brock Lesnar in a no-holds-barred match where if Triple H loses, he must retire. My prediction was Triple H would win, and the winner was... Triple H. Of course, we did get to see something very special, and that was HBK super kicking Mr. Paul Heyman, which was just awesome to see. Sweet chin music to the walrus, and that was it for Paul Heyman. Then Triple H managed to get the pedigree after many, 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 many Gamora locks on <laughs> Brock Lesnar, many of which Brock Lesnar pounded him into the ground with a almost like a powerbomb-esque move onto steel steps. Didn't matter. Triple H kept locking it in and finally pedigreed him for the win, keeping his job as I said he would and as should have been expected. And in the main event of the evening, the WWE champion, The Rock, took on Cena in Rock vs. Cena 2, where I predicted John Cena, and in the year of Cena, would win the title and the match. And yes, folks, he won the title, he won the match, and he won The Rock's respect. 
They shook hands at the end of the, the match. It was great. It was wonderful. Was it an exciting match? Maybe not the best. I think the best match of the night was probably Taker vs. Punk, as I thought it would be. However, it definitely solidified Cena as the champion going forward. The passing of the torch, whatever you want to call it. Um, Cena Rock 2, over with. A lot of people are always saying, well, we're going to probably see Cena Rock 3. I don't think so. Uh, anybody who picked The Rock to win this match, again, doesn't know the WWE, and they don't know entertainment, because Dwayne Johnson, who is The Rock, is off to film a movie called Hercules. So, how could he stay as champion when he's probably going to be gone for the next three to four months filming movies, plus doing press for the movies that he's got coming out? It just made absolutely no sense for the WWE to employ somebody as their champion who wasn't going to be there. So John Cena is your champion once again, and we can hear that famous line, The champ is here. And with that, folks, that's another Warlock Hour finished for this week, and I hope you come back next week and listen. And also remember to listen to all the podcasts here on anotherpodcast.com and on iTunes. Tune in tomorrow for Teen Talk Thursdays, and have a great evening, day, morning, whatever you're listening. See you next week. Thanks for listening to Another Podcast from AnotherPodcast.com. Don't forget to go on iTunes and or download right from AnotherPodcast.com. That's E-H-N-O-T-H-E-R Podcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Another Podcast. Be sure to check back for tomorrow's show only on Another Podcast, your Canadian podcast network. AnotherPodcast.com, not a sponsor.